Okay, good afternoon everyone, good afternoon to those of you who are online right now. Um, this is going to be a short live video, so those of you who miss it, you can catch up later on. Now, I posted a video recently on my Facebook page, uh, one of my TikTok videos. I had no idea I was going to get so many views. I, I am currently over 23,000 views on my TikTok video that I posted about a man who was angry at me for preaching uh, and calling him out on his sin. Because when I go out to preach, I not only preach, but I also confront people in their sin. If I'm preaching and I see someone walking by sucking on smoke, weed, I'm going to say, you need to repent. If I see someone walking by and all of a sudden I hear them cursing, I'm going to tell them that they need to repent. So, I'm going to start a conversation with you, whether you like it or not. You can ignore me, if you want. You can respond to me, if you want. But if you, if you, uh, if you disrespect me or insult me, I'm going to tell you, God bless you. I'm going to tell you, God bless you. Because the Bible says, if anyone uh, curses you, you must bless them and do not curse them back. So, that's why. So, uh, this short live video is going to be, you know... Uh, a response, I made a response, I made a, a very, very long response, and I posted on my YouTube channel, and a lot of you uh, don't want to go on there. Actually had to uh, block and unfriend someone for for uh, pretending as if he or, he or she wanted to actually hear me out and hear the biblical basis for what I was saying, but didn't. Just wanted to throw their opinion and then leave it at that. I'm supposed to just take your opinion and not try to defend what I said. Yeah, so that's the way I am. If 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 uh if I put a video up and you watch the video, you disagree with the video and you claim that I'm being unbiblical and then I make a video so that you can watch the video to see if I'm being biblical or not and you say no, you're not interested then I am not interested in hearing your opinions about anything I post anymore. Because you're not willing to hear me out. You're not willing to hear the full story. You're not willing to hear the full explanation. All you want to do is conclude that I am wrong and then hold on to your conclusion, even though your conclusion may be wrong. But people like that, I don't, I don't waste my time with. Anyways... A lot of you think that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for mankind. Every human being who ever lived, every human being who is living, and every human being who will live in the future. A lot of you have been told that growing up, and a lot of you believe that. And the biblical basis that you can actually make reference to for that is John chapter 3 verse 16, which says in most translations, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. Now in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in originally, there's no such word whosoever at that particular verse. There's no word there that represents the word in English, whosoever. But the word that's there is the ones believing or the believing ones. That's what is there literally in the Greek. And the word so love the world, the word so love the world is not in the Greek. It's not there. But literally, what John chapter 3 verse 16 should say, if you look at the Greek, and you can fact check me on this. For God in this way loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that the believing ones would not perish but have eternal life. That's what John chapter 3 verse 16 literally says. Which means that God sent his son into the world, that the believing ones would not perish. Okay, let's get into this whole thing about believing. Uh, what I always say when I'm preaching the gospel is this. I make it very general. I say, 
God sent his son into the world to die for everyone who would ever believe. Or, God sent his son into the world for those who would believe. And why can I say that and be biblical? One, because God knows all things. And two, God is the author and finisher of faith. God knows who will believe because God has decreed who will believe. God knows who will believe because God has already chosen who he will enable to believe. And if you don't believe me, John chapter 6, verse 29. The words of Jesus. Jesus says, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. God is the one who works faith in you. God is the one who gives you faith. Hebrews chapter 12 says that God is the author and finisher of faith. God is the one who enables you to believe. You cannot believe in God without the grace of God. And God has decided who will believe. And I explained in the video I posted recently that those who God enables to believe are God's elect. Those he has elected before the foundation of the world for salvation in Jesus Christ. They are the ones who Jesus came to die for. Not everyone who ever lived. That's why we have in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Not everyone is the church. The church is the called out assembly. And let's go to Romans chapter 8, which brings this out even more by even mentioning the word elect. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who is Paul talking about in this text? Let's follow on. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. There it is. God delivered up Jesus Christ for us all. Paul is speaking about the elect. Paul is among the elect. So Paul can say for us all. God gave Jesus Christ up for us all. And who will bring a charge against God's elect? No one can bring a charge against God's elect. Why? Because God has washed away all their sin. It is the elect of God that Jesus Christ came to die for. Not every human being, not mankind, not everyone who ever lived and everybody who will ever live. It is for all the elect who ever lived, all the elect who are living now, and all the elect who will ever live. The elect of God, chosen by God before the foundation of the world for salvation. That is why Romans chapter 9 verse uh, 11 to 13 can say these words. For though the twins were not yet born and had done nothing, good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his election would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. So when God chooses his elect, it is not because of their works, but it is because of God who calls. Verse 12. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Verse 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. God hates those he has not elected, and God loves those he has elected. God has a right to love those he wants to love. God has a right and God has the freedom to give those he wants love and the others he wants hatred. God decides. God has freedom. A lot of us think that we are owed love from God. A lot of us think that God is obligated to love us. A lot of us think that God is somehow indebted to us and is supposed to love us. God is not indebted to us. We are not lovable. We are very offensive and we are very hate-worthy and, and guilty of sin. God is not obligated to love us. God is not obligated to love us. So when we hear the Bible say that God loves anyone, we should be surprised. 
We should not be surprised if the Bible says God hates anyone. Because all of us deserve the hatred of God. All of us deserve the wrath of God. But God's elect, who He has chosen, God's elect, who are sinners, by the way, God decides to love them and sent His Son to die for them. And that is something that we are supposed to be surprised about, that God would even send His Son to die for guilty sinners. But He did. He did. Because there are those who God loves because of His grace, because of His mercy, because of His own good pleasure, not because of anything we've done. And there are those who God has hated because of the wicked things that they have done. So the Bible says that Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And then the question then becomes this in verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Because the common response is this. It's wrong, God, for you to love one and hate the other. But the Bible says there is no injustice with God. God is doing something right. God is doing something just. When he hates the one who is hate-worthy, when he hates the one who deserves to be hated, God is not wrong. But a lot of us think that God loves the sinner and hates the sin and cannot prove from the Bible that God does. But the Bible does teach that God hates sinners. God does hate sinners. And I said that in the video I posted on my TikTok that caused an uproar. Listen to what the Bible says. Psalm chapter 5, verse 4 to verse 6. Particularly to verse 6 and verse 5. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. In verse 6, the Bible says, You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord hates the man of bloodshed and deceit. And when you look at Hosea chapter 9, verse 15, the Bible says, I have come to hate them there because of the wickedness of their deeds. This is talking about people, man. But a lot of us don't read our Bibles. So when people say that God hates the sinner, you start to call the person who said that a false teacher and a wicked man or a wicked woman because you've never heard that before. Why? Because you've never read your Bible. Or you've read your Bible, but you have not read that part. So the video I posted, everyone, about when I told the man that God hates him, I'm not lying. I'm not being unbiblical. The Bible teaches it. So stop coming down on me as if I did something wrong or as if I said something wrong. Now I can agree that the way I said it or the way I was speaking to him was wrong. But what I said out of my mouth was not wrong. God does hate. And God does hate him in his sin. And if he is one of God's elect, God hates him in his sin. But God will remove that hatred when God brings him to salvation because God will bring all of his elect to salvation. That's why Jesus Christ said these words in John chapter 6, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The giving of the Father to the Son preceded the coming of the ones who were given to the Son. And that's found in uh, uh, John 6, 35. Well, John 6, verse 37. And then verse 38 says this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verse 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. This is talking about God's sheep, God's people. That's why when you look at John chapter 10, verse 30, well, rather, verse 20, uh, 5 to verse 29, but reading here verse 6. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Verse 28. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29. Hear this carefully. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. God has given to the Son a people before the foundation of the world. These people are the sheep of God. These people will come to Christ. These people will believe. They will hear His voice. And the Bible also says these words in John chapter 6, verse 44, that um, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God comes and draws His elect. 
God comes and he brings those he has sent the Son into the world to die for. And none of them will perish because God will bring every single one of them to salvation. God has a right to choose who he wants to save and God has a right to love who he wants to love. We do not demand God to love everyone in this entire world because he does not and he does not have to. God is not obligated to you or I. He's not. So the Bible does teach that God hates the sinner and God hates the sin. God hates them both. It does not teach that God hates the sin and love the sinner. Those he loves are his elect. He loves his elect. He loves his elect. And he hates everyone else. And you can tell one of God's elect that God hates him or her while they are living in their sin because they are a child of wrath according to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes to the Ephesians when he says to them, We were by nature children of wrath. We are all born objects of God's wrath and God's hatred until we are brought to salvation. Until we're brought to salvation. And I'm one of God's elect. And you can know you're one of God's elect by the faith that you have. By the faith that God has given you. And you can rightly say of yourself, if you're one of God's elect, that God truly hated you when you were living in sin. But God now loves you without any hatred in mind or any hatred in his eyes and feeling for you. Because you are now brought to salvation. So this is all I have to say. So for those of you out there who disagree with what I said, you have to prove me wrong from the Bible. Don't give me your opinions. I'm not interested in your opinion. Give me what the Bible says. The Bible says that God hates all those who do iniquity. And then you're going to quote a verse on me and says that God loves the world. Does that solve the problem or does that contradict the Bible? Can't leave it like that. So the reconciliation I gave is this. And this is very short and precise. God simultaneously has a temporal love for the non-elect and an eternal hatred for the non-elect. Simultaneously, temporal love and eternal hatred for the non-elect. And the love that he has for them, those who are not his elect, is a general love that he has for all of his creation. He opens his hands and all the creatures of the world receive their food. He allows the sun to rise on the wicked and the good. That's the temporal love because that love will be gone when they die. Temporal love. And it can also be said that God blesses the wicked so that he can destroy the wicked. Because the Bible says in Psalm chapter 94, verse uh, 5 and 6, that when the wicked flourish, it was only so that they could be destroyed forevermore. And who causes the wicked to flourish? God. And I don't want to misquote that verse. I'm going to make sure I quoted it correctly and quoted it uh, in the right uh, location. Psalm chapter 94. Not 94, Psalm chapter 92. Psalm 92. The Bible says in verse 7, When the wicked sprout up like grass and all who did iniquity flourish, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. God is the one who causes the wicked to flourish. God is the one who causes the wicked to sprout up like grass. And the purpose is, is so that they might be destroyed forevermore. So when we say God loves the wicked and God blesses the wicked, it can also be seen as hatred and wrath. So that's what I said about the non-elect. Now for the elect, there is a temporal hatred and simultaneously an eternal love. The temporal hatred that God has for his elect is removed when they are brought to faith in Jesus Christ. But it is there very, 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 very truly while they are living in their sin. And when they are brought to faith, that hatred is removed. And that eternal love that has been there from before the foundation of the world stays and is the only thing that is there. No hatred anymore. So the summary is 
God has an eternal hatred and a temporal love for the non-elect and God has a eternal love and eternal love and a temporal hatred for the elect and that is the summary that is the reconciliation so that is what I had to say that is what I have to say all I have to say at this point so I hope that you guys understand and if you disagree open your Bible and make a video and respond to this one because if anybody is saying God loves everybody you're going to have a problem, especially when you read Leviticus chapter 20, verse 23, where God says that he hates all of the nations that were in Canaan who were destroyed by the Israelites when God used the Israelites as a means of judgment on all the seven nations that had millions of people because he hated them. And as well, first. Samuel chapter 15, which speaks about the Amalekites, who God hates, who God hates, and wanted to destroy every single one of them, including their infants and babies. And all of these things may sound shocking to you because you think that God must love and God is obligated to love everyone. But if you understand who you are, if you understand what we are, we're guilty sinners and we deserve nothing but the wrath and judgment of God. When you understand who you are, these things are not surprising. When you understand that you do not deserve the love of God, these things are not shocking to you. Not even a baby deserves God's love. Because the Bible says in Psalm chapter 58, verse 2 and 3, that the wicked go astray from the womb. And Psalm chapter 51, verse 5, that we're all conceived in sin and born in iniquity. We're born sinners. That's why you don't have to teach your child how to do the wrong things because it comes naturally. None of us deserve God's love. None of us. So we have to understand. The video I posted on my Facebook page, my TikTok video, that's having a lot of views and that's causing an uproar, I did not say anything wrong. God does hate that man. And God did hate me. God hates him because he's living in sin. And God hated me because I was living in sin. And God hates every single one of you who are living in sin. If you are his elect, yes, he hates you living in your sin. And when he brings you to faith, he will no longer hate you. But if you are not his elect, he hates you and he will continue to hate you. And he'll send you to hell. You have no excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. And some of you may not, may not have heard any of these things that I'm saying before. Because most of you on here are Pentecostals. Most of you on here are Arminians. But I'm a Calvinist. Or you can say I'm an Augustinian. Look up those things. Look up what they mean. Look up the, 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 the London Baptist Confession of Faith 1689. Look these things up. Be a reader. Study. Look at the scriptures. See if what I'm saying is true. See if what I'm saying is false. And don't look at what I say, listen to what I say, and then conclude that I'm a false teacher without first checking the things for yourself. Because these things really, really bother me when I see or hear people calling me a false teacher and they can't prove it from the Bible. And it's always people who don't know their Bible. People who claim that the Spirit of God is talking to them and the Spirit of God told them that I'm wrong. Couldn't I easily say the Spirit of God told me that I'm right and both of us are now in contradiction? No, there must be a standard. We open the Bible and we see who's right, we see who's wrong. Alright, All right. so I'm done here. Uh, have a good night. I know I'm going to have to put up some more videos explaining myself, but that's fine. I know I'm not wrong in what I said. God's Word stands and I know God's Word. And I know that those of you out there who know God's Word, you agree. God bless you all. Have a good night.